The Working Cows Podcast, Episode 2. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. This episode of the Working Cows Podcast is brought to you by Kamak Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. On this episode of the Working Cows Podcast, we're discussing the four pillars of a profitable ranching operation. Dallas Mount is our guest today. Dallas Mount is a University of Wyoming Extension educator. Dallas has served the southeast area of Wyoming as a livestock systems extension educator with the University of Wyoming since 2001. Dallas's background includes ranch work in the cow-calf, yearling, feedlot, and hay production segments. His passions include teaching profit and resource-focused ranch management work- workshops, where he constantly learns from innovative ranchers. Dallas co-developed the High Plains Ranch Practicum School, an eight-day systems-based ranch management school focused on economics, range and forage, production, and people. Dallas and his family operate a management-intensive grazing operation near Wheatland, Wyoming. Dallas, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. I'm looking forward to taking an opportunity to sit down with you and to pick your brain a little bit about some of these practices and some of these sectors in the agriculture operations that can help maximize people's uh, effectiveness and profitability. So thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. I'm really excited about the podcast you're putting together, and I love the idea. So thanks for having me as a guest. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start out just kind of hearing a little bit about your background, what brought you into the ranching industry, what brought you into uh, the University of Wyoming Ascension program, and some of the things you're doing uh, with Ranching for Profit and the High Plains Ranch Practicum. Sure, Clay. Yeah. Um, I did not grow up in agriculture. Um, I grew up in, in cities primarily, but got interested in ag uh, about late high school. Um, and I think in some ways that's an advantage because you're, you're not raised ingrained with the this is how we always do it ideas. Um, I did a bachelor's and master's at Colorado State um, and and uh, was left school extremely dangerous because I thought I was smart. Um, I, <laughs> I hit the ground and started working for some ranchers. Um, in uh, in Colorado, both in the plains and in the mountains, I spent a year in a feedlot, uh, and then I and then I got a job in extension, and uh, that's really when I started being exposed to some people that were outstanding ranchers and, and doing things in a different way. Um, Harlan Hughes uh, was, was one of my mentors, uh, helped me understand looking at the economic side of the ranch. Uh, and, and then I, you know, some other folks that have influenced me have been Aaron Berger uh, with Extension in Nebraska, Dave Pratt uh, with uh, Ranching for Profit, Alan Crockett with Ranching for Profit, Burke Tigert, like reading some of his writings. And, and then the countless ranchers that I've had the opportunity to work with and have been brave enough and to uh, open their uh, ranches, their homes, their books to me and, and, uh, let me work with them and, and learn from them as well. So what, uh, my, my ideas are that, that ranching can be profitable, that it must be profitable. It's going to be sustainable. Um, and that, uh, you know, really in order to, to achieve those things, you, you're going to have to do things differently and you can't, you can't ranch the way the neighbor does, uh, or that the family has always done. Uh, it, the only thing that's constant is change. So, uh, you better be looking for different ways to do things and challenging the status quo. If you want to stay in business for, for very long. Do you think that the, um, necessity of change has been a development over time? Has that been something that we have to start doing things differently because, of changes in the market, changes in the global economy? Has that been, or has it at least accentuated the need for change in your mind? 
You know, I, I, I guess I've only been paying attention probably 15 years, really. Um, so my my time frame is pretty pretty narrow on this. But I, I think it's always been here. Maybe just the rate of change is getting faster. At least that's the way it feels to me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it's always been around. It's just maybe we're, we're, we're finally, I'm finally becoming aware of it in a, in a significant way. So what developed that, uh, desire to spend your life, uh, both I think as a producer and investing in producers? Sure. Uh, I guess I really enjoy ranching. Uh, I, d- I do it myself. Uh, we've got a, a grass place here in Wheatland uh, that, that right now, the last few years, we've been custom grazing cows on. Um, so I, I'm really passionate about the, the business, about the uh, ecology of things. I love the fact that ranching is so stinking complicated and that there's so many moving parts to it. Um, it's really intellectually interesting, um, you know, because you, ha- you have to be an ecologist. You have to be an economist. You have to understand uh, animal biology somewhat and, and be able to put all these things together and make decisions in a, in a systems framework. So for one thing, it's, it's really exciting, and I, I love working with animals. I love being outside. And then I really like the ranching culture and interacting with people that are involved in ranching. I mean, the people I think are some of the best folks in the world. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, what's drawn me to it. Yeah, I was talking to my dad the other day, and he said that uh, Mike Rowe and his new uh, kind of endeavor has been talking about how the people who work outside and work with their hands and are, uh, you know, doing the dirty jobs, so to speak, are often the most happy people or have always been the most happy people that he has met. And uh it certainly has rung true in my life and, and uh, has been – I spent some time in the city, enough to know that I uh, love the lifestyle that I grew up with as a ranch kid and enough to, to, to know that I want to spend the rest of my life uh, investing in um, making a profitable operation. So, Cool. Yeah, I feel the same way. So I think that's a good segue uh, into – what I want to talk about today is kind of a systems approach to our examination of our own operations and uh, kind of how we go about examining the different sectors or the different systems within our operation. What what are those different sectors, I guess, is a place where we should start, and then maybe we can dive in and look a little bit more into uh, what each one of those sectors, uh, how we can maximize uh, the effectiveness of each of those sectors. Sure, sure. Would you would you like me to go through them, or do you, did you want to do that? I will defer to you. <laughs> okay, all right. Sounds good. So uh, you know, in, in my introduction, I probably didn't do a very good job saying what what I do. I I teach both uh, uh, the ranch practicum school, which is something Aaron and I have developed uh, with our roles with University Extension Service. Uh, the ranch practicum school is an eight day course uh, that takes ranchers over a over a, about a five-month period through the different facets of ranch management. Uh, I also get to teach the Ranching for Profit School, uh, which is an an outstanding business school for ranchers. Uh, So uh, both of these, we divide up the main segments of uh, looking at your ranch business into uh, four key pillars. Uh, So the land or the ecology is being one of those. The production enterprises, so whether it's cows, sheep, goats, hay, Farming, whatever those production enterprises are, that's a, that's a part we need to focus on, and and probably that's the part that ranchers are pretty good at focusing on already. I mean, people, you know, cowmen love talking about cows, right? Um, but uh, the next part would be the the money, uh, the economics, the finance, uh, looking at at uh, how does the cash flow? Can I pay my bills? How are my enterprises in terms of profitability? Where where am I making money? Where is uh, value being drawn out of the business? And then the last one is the people side of, of the business. And, uh, you know, how am I doing at, at managing the people that work with me? Uh, what about managing that difficult family business interaction? Uh, and, and how do we go about those things? So those are the four pillars that we talk about in each one of those schools. What do you think, which one of those pillars typically presents the greatest roadblock to success in your mind? <laughs> Without a doubt, it's the people. Uh, the the people is the most challenging part uh, to to work through. To you know, we're all uh, we're all have our skills in certain areas. And in, in ranching, we generally don't get into ranching because we like working with people. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so oftentimes, for for those folks in the business, that's one of the things that we struggle with the most. 
Okay, so the people is the, and in the interest of full disclosure, I have been a student of Dallas's through the uh, High Plains Ranch Practicum, and it has been a um, very eye-opening experience. I have loved every minute of both the class and the outdoor times. Um, Just been something that has been really uh, invigorating to me as someone who enjoys uh, looking at things from a different perspective and opening my eyes to different ways of of thinking and uh thinking about these four pillars so uh yeah those those people relationships can tend to be um a a roadblock to success that i think that we need to maybe spend a little bit of time looking into how can we successfully navigate those relationships so what are some best practices that you have come across and that you uh encourage in your um teaching capacities for people looking to succeed in the people management side of the ranching industry. Oh yeah, sure. So, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about Jolene Brown and I've heard her speak a few times and she works uh, with farm families in the Midwest and has a lot of good information that applies to, uh, you know, any small business and, and managing these people relationships. Uh, and she talks about being a family first family or a business first family. And it, it, the idea of if, if we're a family and we're in business together, what comes first? Is it, it, are we a family first and then we also run a business or are we in business together and then we also are a family? And when I, when I first heard that, I thought, well, we're family first, right? Family is the most important and we, you know, we have to put family first in all the things we do. And, and what she says, and it kind of challenged me at first, but the more I think about it and the, and the interactions I've had with folks, I really find it to be true, is we have to get the business relationships right so that we can be a family. And so she says, be a business first family. So we, we put the business and we deal with those things so that then once we, that we have those things right and they're structured well, now we can be a family. And I really appreciate the, the way that she puts that and, and the challenges that she gives on that. And I, I think there's a lot to be said for making sure things are done well on the business side of things, that, that communication is happening, that people understand their roles, that they're being held accountable uh, to to fulfill those roles, to do the things that they say they're going to do, just like if they were an employee in any other business. And then once those things are handled well, now we can be a family and, uh, and, we, and we can enjoy those kind of relationships. Otherwise, it, it just really gets in the way of, of you know, the, the family relationships, which are so important to us. I, I had lunch yesterday with a, with a rancher uh, who's, who's gone into business with his son. And, uh, it, it's a ranching business and, and he's really financed the whole ranching operation. He's, uh, he's purchased the equipment, he's, uh, he's purchased the cows and, and son is making all the decisions and calling all the shots. And I mean, you know, that's pretty great to have that kind of autonomy, but, uh, dad who's, whose dollars are being, uh, are used here and are being put at risk has zero communication from son about this is our strategy uh, this is, you know, what we're doing. This is our business plan. And uh, dad's asked for this several times and, and son won't produce it. And dad's like, you know, I think I'm done with it. I I think I'm uh, I'm, I'm tired of my money being used foolishly and uh, I'm going to have to have to cut him off here. And and so we were having a conversation at lunch yesterday with how does he back out of this and preserve the relationship. And uh, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, and in looking back on it, the the expectation should have been better laid from the beginning that hey if i'm going to put and we're talking about a 3 quarter million dollars here if i'm going to if i'm going to put 3 quarters of million dollars of my retirement nest egg towards your ranching habit uh, this is what i'm going to expect of you uh, you you know i'm going to expect quarterly earnings reports i'm going to expect some risk analysis, some projections on, hey, if things go well, this is how this business might perform. If things go poorly, this is what we might lose. Um, you know, and, and and make sure that deal was made up front. And then I think everybody would have felt better about moving forward. And then if we were at this stage and those things weren't being done, I think Sun would probably feel, you know what, gosh, I really I agreed to do those things. I haven't done them. Uh, you know, any reasonable boss would fire me. Or, or take their equity out of the deal. Um, so it it uh, now at the stage that we're at, it, I'm afraid the relationship's going to be damaged uh, as it moves forward. Sure, and that's that's such that's exactly what we're trying to 
to help prevent here at the Working Cows podcast, and I know that's what you're doing with Ranching for Profit and the High Plains Ranch Practicum, to get those people in a room and make them aware of some of the pitfalls that they are facing as producers and some of the things that they can do to avoid those pitfalls. And it's that kind of -of out-of-the-box thinking of let's be a business-first family so that when we are together as a family, we're not uh, thinking about how my brother really screwed us with his decision the other day, that we had everybody in a room and we made that decision together as a business. And now when we're together as a family, there's none of this, uh, there's none of this complication and and we can be a family. Am am I understanding your, your perspective? Exactly. Exactly. You got it. So, you know, I, I think one of the tools we, uh, we talk about in Ranching for Profit is using the org chart. And, uh, and and we introduced you guys to that the other day. It comes out of the book called The E-Myth. Uh, so, you know, having people have specific roles in the business uh, and, and have responsibilities for those and, and make that uh, organization structure in your ranch business clear. Uh, so that you know who's in charge, uh, who's the CEO, and what is a reasonable C- – what is a, a, a well-functioning, competent CEO? What kind of things are they going to do? And and uh, what about the person that's in charge of, of putting together the cash flow? Uh, who is that? When do we expect to see the cash flow? What kind of things uh, will be in the cash flow? And making sure those things are clear and, and that, so that folks can be held accountable to making making them – making sure they get them done. Yeah, you've got to have somebody who's responsible for whatever it is that's getting done. And you can look at them and say, this got done, you did it, good job. Or this didn't get done, what can we do to improve next time? And it's it, exactly. it's got to be somebody that you can exactly. look at. You know, one of the things we as we talk about that, um, oftentimes we think, oh my gosh, we're going to ask somebody to do something else in the business. And Really, what, as you think about yourself and what motivates you, at least what motivates me is is being given, being handed responsibility for tasks that I see as important in the business. So we might think about it as, oh gosh, I don't want to burden Clay with this uh, important job, but maybe he's back there thinking, man, I'd really like to be responsible for making sure that gets done. And uh, you know, sometimes giving people responsibility for things is an honor rather than a burden. Yep, and it's a motivating factor that you know that people are going to look to you and say they're going to review how you did, and you get to you get to give it your all and and try and do your best to make it a successful endeavor, and that's that's important. That's right. So uh, I think that's uh, very helpful. Uh, something that we've taken the opportunity to whet some appetites more, uh, get people into looking into the people side of their operation. And I, I appreciate that. Before we dive into uh, the other three pillars, uh, the land, the production, and the economics, I'd like to take a minute to uh, thank our sponsors. This episode of the Working Cows podcast is brought to you by Kamak Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. They understand the needs of ranchers and farmers whether you need to take care of your livestock, horses, or even building supplies. They have everything you need to work your cows, whether that be the chute you work them through, the water you bring them to, or the tools you use to make them go up that chute a little bit faster. So check out KamakRanchSupply.com for all of your ranching needs. All right, we're back here with Dallas Mount of University of Wyoming Extension and uh, a few other hats that he wears that we've been talking about today, but mostly focusing on the four pillars of a successful uh, ranching industry or ranching um, operation. We've talked about the people side of it. Um, I guess maybe we should go in the next, uh, in the order of next biggest roadblock that you typically find people experiencing trouble um being successful in this pillar economics and finance would be would be the next one all right so what are we what can we do in the economics and finance area to uh, maximize our uh, return on our investment of our time get off your horse and get off your tractor and get in the office and do some work (laughs) (laughs) how about that that's good plain and simple just like we want it yep uh, you know, and I think part of it's learning how to do it. Uh, oftentimes when we were raised in agriculture, dad, dad taught us how to build a fence and how to pull a calf, but he, he didn't teach us how to do a cash flow and how to run economic projections on the enterprises in our businesses. And that sounds really intimidating and complicated, but it's not. 
I mean, it, it's just a bunch of little steps and figuring out how to do them. Uh, and then it's going to put you in control of your business and, and where, where your business is going to lead you. So um, we, we separate these two out, economics and finance. Let's start with economics. Economics is, is asking the question of, is my business profitable? And how can I make it more profitable? Uh, so when we look at a ranch business, we split that business into its enterprises. Uh, so your cow-calf operation is going to be an enterprise. And that would essentially be all the cows taking that calf to weaning. Uh, once that calf is weaned, if you retain it, then then you're essentially moving into a stalker enterprise or a backgrounding enterprise. Um, so we, we separate your ranch business into its various enterprises and we do an economic analysis on those, which essentially just where am I creating value and what are the costs of creating that value? And then we see which are working and which are not. And for most ranch businesses, there's something going on inside that business that is economically losing money. And if we can identify what that thing is, and then if you don't like doing it, you stop doing it, you'll make more. It's a crazy thought, right? How can I – I can stop doing something. I can work less and I can make more and that that's what we're saying in, in the economics part of that is let's figure out what's not working. Let's stop doing it and then let's figure out what is working. Can we make it better and then let's do more of it? Yeah, I think that's an important thing is we find what is working and then we scale it up if we can and we make it a, a more profitable industry. And I think a lot of that – and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think a lot of that is going to be tied to your region. Uh, what is profitable in one area is going to be different than what's profitable in another area because of the region that you find yourself in. There, there's going to be regional advantages for sure in some things, but uh, I, I, I think there will be less regional effect than what we might think. Uh, sometimes uh, it, what I find is it's, it, generally the thing that's profitable or are, are the thing that that person's most passionate about and is, is, good, is good at. Uh, oftentimes you, you see ranchers that put up hay because they feel like they need to or they have to, and they hate putting up hay. Well, generally when you go in and evaluate those businesses, the hay business really stinks because they've treated it as a stepchild, right? You know, we don't really care about it. We don't like doing it, but we really like our cows and we're passionate about our cows and we really want to do a good job with them. Well, oftentimes the cows are working. Now that's not always the case, but, uh, but sometimes that's what we find. Uh, so, yeah. Sure. Definitely the thing that I noticed as we went through this in the class was that these are all numbers. Almost all of these are numbers that you already know in your industry, in your, in your business or in your, your, uh, production, your, your ranching business, you already know these numbers a lot of times. It's just, you haven't yeah. been putting them into, uh, any kind of a format that you can gain any knowledge from what you know, or gain any benefit right. from what you already know. Right. Yeah. Oftentimes the most difficult number to come to when we do a cow calf analysis is how many cows do you have? <laughs> and surprisingly, that can be a difficult one to, to come to or how many did you expose to breeding? You know, those kind of things. But uh, but yeah, the, these numbers aren't really all that difficult to come up with. It's like you said, it's just a matter of structuring them right and putting them in the in the right spots to that we can get usable information from. Sure. Yeah, that, that cow number, how many cows do I have? Well, it depends on when you count. And that's really, I think, probably what you're talking about with the uh, the difficulty in determining that number is because you got to figure out when you start counting. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that's economics. Uh, finance is really related to cash flow. And, and use of leverage, um, use of debt, those kind of things. So, um, you know, how how, do, how does the ranch cash flow? Uh, do I have enough money to meet my obligations um, and, and those kind of things? And really, those are difficult uh, or different decisions in the economic decisions. We can have a plan that economically makes a lot of sense, but if it takes $100,000 in startup money to do it, and you don't have $100,000 or the ability to get that, um, you, you can be in a financial bind. Uh, just like we can look at ranches that financially work, but economically are losing money. So uh, if, you've, if you happen to be landing on a ranch that the, all the land is paid for and all the cows are paid for, uh, you can operate that ranch at an economic loss, uh, but cash flow through it. Okay, so uh, we're we're getting a little deep into the weeds here, and that's probably as deep as I want to go on that. But but we do spend time uh, looking at the finances of the business as well as the economics. Sure. So we've talked about a couple of uh, typical roadblocks for the typical ranching industry or ranching operation. 
what do you think are some of the greatest areas where there's opportunity to um, to really get the best return on our investment of our of our time and our our resources? Uh, that'd probably be take us to that next pillar, which is the land. Um, and and I think as as ranchers start looking at their businesses uh, from an, from an economic perspective and and stepping back and looking at the whole picture, uh, we see that really if we're in the ranching business, we're largely in the business of land management and growing grass. And so when you ask the question of where can we get the greatest return for our dollar spent and our time spent, I oftentimes not always, but oftentimes it comes into becoming better grazers. Uh, so if we can get better at growing grass and better at harvesting that grass w- with an animal that's producing a positive economic return, we can have an enormous impact on our bottom line as, as well as the whole capacity of our place. Um, so I, I think of a ranch that, uh, you know, their cows were, are making a margin of, of maybe th- uh, 400 bucks a head, um, but yet they're, it's really holding them back is capacity, and they, they just don't have enough head to support the, the people that are on that ranch. So uh, oftentimes if we start, start looking at the forage base on that place, we can find, well, hey, if we develop some water here, if we got our grazing a little better here so that we weren't overgrazing these pastures every year, we were giving them more time to recover, and then we, we split some pastures so we got better animal distribution. Uh, they were getting to that back corner that they never went to before. Uh, now I can start adding cattle and, and adding animals that have a positive margin on them um, and, and increasing the capacity of that ranch while maintaining and improving land health at the same time. I can have an enormous impact on the bottom line of that ranch. Yeah, I think that one of the things that has really um, opened my eyes is just the idea that when a cow comes into a pasture, if she has free choice to graze the whole pasture all at once, she's going to go through and pick out the best stuff first. And then she might move on to less desirable forage, but she'll probably go back and graze that best stuff a second time after it's had some time to regrow. Is that a pretty good understanding of how that typically works? That is, yeah. And that's, you know, you talk, people talk about overgrazing a lot. And, and uh, what you just described is overgrazing happening. Uh, it, the, what in what can be a very lightly stocked situation. So you could have overgrazing happening with one horse in a in a thousand acre pasture, right? That horse is going to graze those most tender, best tasting plants, and then a few weeks later, if those plants are growing, it's going to come back and regraze those same plants, right? And it's not going to graze. Uh, the the less desirable, which are now probably the ranker and taller plants in that pasture. So those plants are being overgrazed. So, you know, overgrazing happens on a plant by plant basis. So if we can stop the overgrazing and then we can start allowing those plants full opportunity to recover in between grazings, we can do a lot for pasture health, which will then correlate to increased carrying capacity, allowing us to run more animals and uh, hopefully have a better economic impact on our, on our total business. Sure limit limit their selection uh or limit the the amount of area they have to choose from so that they graze off everything kind of evenly uh and then maybe later even you could come back to that after some regrowth if we're talking about a growing season uh type of a grazing situation you got it so i guess that leaves one pillar uh that would be the production side of it uh what do you got what are we typically looking at as far as some things that we can do on the production side to uh, improve. I think you said typically in a ranching industry or a ranching operation, this is the, the bread and butter. This is what they love. This is, what, this is why they're in the industry. And some of the other things they do, they tolerate it because they have to. Uh, what are some of the things that we can do to do what we love to do even better? Sure. Yeah. So, so your podcast is about b- challenging paradigms, and I think one of the biggest p- paradigms we can challenge in the production uh, pillar is the idea that productivity is correlated with profitability. And just because I'm a productive ranch, that I should be a profitable ranch, and it doesn't work that way at all. Um, you know, we look at a lot of ranches that are extremely productive, that wean really big calves, and have great performance numbers. And they're absolutely losing their shirt in terms of profitability. So uh, I think when we look at the production side of the ranch, we have to quit talking about weaning weights. We have to quit talking about, you know, raising big fancy calves. And we need to start looking at 
what are my profitability numbers? What are my targets on that? Uh, so when we when we dissect a ranch in terms of profitability, we, on the production side, we find the biggest thing that gives us a lever is um, is getting out of the feeding business. Okay, anytime we can. Uh, avoid putting equipment between a cow and what she consumes. We're generally going to improve the profitability of that of that operation. Uh, so the more we can feed a cow with grazing, and the less we can feed a cow with uh, with having to be fed out of a machine, uh, the be- the better we're going to be. So. Looking at how do I structure the business so, you know, what used to take me two tons of hay to get a cow through the wintertime, how can I do that with a quarter ton or, or even no hay? You know, are there ways to do that? And so so that brings us to the conversation of, of matching the production schedule with the environment and with the seasons. Uh, you know, if we're asking a cow to calve in January and February – uh, I don't see many ways to to get out of the feeding business. Okay, we're going to be kind of locked into a, a two ton, maybe even three to four ton per cow feeding business. So, but if we shift that production schedule towards a more spring uh, or, or summer calving season, uh, and it all depends on the resources you have. I mean, there's not a prescription for a profitable ranch. I don't want to be sitting here saying everybody should calve in May and June because everybody shouldn't. But we have to look at the resources we have and what's the way I can do it most cost effectively to give us my give me my biggest return at the end of the year yeah and i think that is i mean this is what we love this is what this is why we're in the industry because we love to manage herds and what i think that i'm taking away from our discussion just given on the uh, based on the sheer amount of time that we spent on the different pillars today is that if you don't get the people uh part of it right and you don't get the economics part of it right you aren't going to get to manage the forage you aren't going to get to manage the herd because they're going to be taken away from you by uh, circumstances that are beyond your control have you seen that ring true i have yeah so we i mean we can there, there's some outstanding cattlemen that uh, do a really good job raising raising quality beef uh, but the whole thing's coming crashing down around them because they're losing money doing it and the people around them don't enjoy being around them. I mean, who wants to work for a business that's in economic distress, right? And so you're going to move on to something else and and uh, the the guy that's raising these big fancy calves or whatever they're they're doing that they love is going to be doing it by himself for a little while and then pretty much uh, out of business in a while because he never got the economics right. Um, so they are all interrelated and uh, you know to be able to do what we love, like you said, raising cattle and, and doing those things, we have to get these other parts right. Um, and they really become a lot of fun as you learn to do them. I mean, sometimes ranchers think, oh God, I didn't go into ranching because I, I like to run numbers or I, I like to talk about emotions with other people in the business, right? But uh, I think if you figure out how to do those things well, uh, you, you start to enjoy them and, and uh, they become part of, of the fun of ranching as well. And I think that maybe one of the keys to starting to enjoy them is finding somebody around you who does enjoy those numbers and can help you see them in a way that clicks with you and makes you understand the benefit of understanding those numbers. You got it. Absolutely. Anything else you want to uh, leave with us today? Uh, How can people catch up with you, see what you're doing, or how could they... Uh, maybe get in on uh, learning some of these things, um, some resources or some some classes, some different things coming up that they would have an opportunity to uh, to jump in on. Sure. Yeah. You're opening the door for me to give a commercial. I'll take the opportunity. Um, so the, the two things that I'm involved with are the High Plains Ranch Practicum School. That's what Clay's been going through. And it's been a lot of fun having him in the class. We've got an exceptional bunch of students this year. Um, we usually do that uh, once a year. Our class starts in June. We usually recruit in, in May. Um, and uh, it, it, go on, type in High Plains Ranch Practicum in Google and you'll find our website uh, with our dates and, and where we're going to be doing that. Uh, the other thing that I'm involved with, uh, which is another exceptional bunch of ranchers. I mean, one of the things is surrounding yourself with people that are challenging your paradigms and and thinking and, and pushing you forward. So I think in, in agriculture, it's so easy to get caught in the circle of the neighbors, right? And and uh, the pessimistic and the coffee shop talk and all that stuff. And and you have to break out of that. And by listening to the podcast, you're obviously a person that's looking to, to, to broaden your horizons. So, um, 
part of that is finding groups that are, are broadening your horizons and peer groups that are doing that. And another one of those is the Ranching for Profit School. Um, type in Ranching for Profit in, in Google. Uh, you'll find out all their information. There's a free uh, newsletter that comes out twice a week with articles that, that are challenging your paradigms written by Dave Pratt. Uh, Dave, I think, is is the best in the business at uh, at, at teaching ranchers um, profit-minded business management skills and uh, really does a great job doing that. And, and the Ranching for Profit schools are taught all over the country. We do about uh, six or eight a year, um, it, it, mostly west of the Mississippi, uh, but we do, we do go east sometimes. Um, and if you want to have a week-long experience that will change the way you see your business, uh, you need to look at coming to the Ranching for Profit school. It is a significant investment. But it's not significant when you look at the whole – at the big picture. I mean there's – there, if you're in the ranching business, you're probably managing multi-million dollars worth of assets and inventory. And what would any multi-million dollar business look to invest in their, in their key management people on an annual basis a year? Okay. So most of these businesses are putting in at least a month's worth of salary a year in their key management positions. In ranching, if we have to pay 20 bucks to go to a, an extension program in the afternoon, we get cheesed off, right? Okay, We need to change that paradigm, guys. It's time to invest in ourselves, put some money towards our professional improvement, find those things that are going to move our business to the next to the next level, invest our money, and invest our time to make significant changes in our business. And, and that's what I'm here to do is, is help people do that. Uh, if our programs can help you do that, I'd love to have you come. Uh, if I can help you find something else that will move you in the right direction that's not the things we're doing, I'd love to do that. Uh, you know, The way we learn is by interacting with other people that are doing neat stuff and, and challenging the envelope and, and pushing it. So uh, we'd, we'd love to, to help you move your business in the next direction. Yeah, and I think that on top of the challenging of your paradigm that comes with being a part of something like the High Plains Ranch Practicum or Ranching for Profit or any of the other schools that are out there, the networking is invaluable as well. And just some of the re relationships that you get to build with those people and uh, hearing about what they're doing on their operation and the successes they're having and even some of the failures, you know, being able to learn from somebody else's mistake can save you a lot of money. So that's... Uh, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, links to all of the stuff that Dallas just talked about will be on the website at workingcows.net slash two, workingcows.net slash the number two. And you can uh, check out those things there and uh, get yourself involved in uh, maybe expanding your horizons or uh, ch challenging your paradigms, as it were. So thanks, Dallas. All right. Well, thanks so much, Clay. I appreciate the opportunity to be on here. And uh, thanks for doing this. Man, what a need. And uh, your podcast is going in my podcast aggregator uh, as soon as it can. And, and I'm going to be a constant listener. <laughs> all right, thank you. Appreciate that. Well, we say that we're all about providing a producers a platform to share paradigm challenging practices here on the Working Cows podcast. I'm sure Dallas Mount did that for you here today. If he did, I would encourage you to check out some of the resources that are going to be available at workingcows.net slash two. Check out Dave Pratt's biweekly newsletter. Maybe look into attending a school like the High Plains Ranch Practicum or the Ranching for Profit. Uh, pick up Dave's book, Healthy Land, Happy Families, and Profitable Businesses. It's full of short, uh, readable snippets, basically newsletter-sized chapters on different topics, all of the topics that we discussed today, all four of the areas that we discussed today. So check that out if you're interested, and uh, we'll see you next week. We invite you to visit WorkingCows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. <laughs>